Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good. I'm quite. I'm Canadian and very loud. Um, thank you very much, uh, Caroline and Chris, for having us here. Uh, healthcare and just improving the lives of people is something that I'm really passionate about. And so really what I want to talk about today is just some of the work that we're doing um, with a number of pharmaceuticals. And it's less about the design of healthcare products and systems and more about the role we can play as designers, user experience professionals, to help really transform pharmaceuticals and get them moving away from what I call pushing pills, which probably is an incorrect term to use, but from the, the traditional push marketing that I think a lot of the pharmaceuticals have been using, and to start getting to shift they're thinking about how do they can they start better servicing healthcare practitioners, patients, the NHS, um, to really get better outcomes for um, our NHS, uh, but also for patients and, and even themselves. And I talk about transforming. I think everyone hears that buzzword around digital transformation, business transformation, et cetera. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about transformation because I think with a lot of our clients now in pharmaceutical and outside of pharmaceutical, they often think to, to change the way they work, well, we'll just do a project and then it's, it's done, right? And I think that's a really important thing to talk about is like, actually, if you really want to start thinking about how you provide a better service, a better experience for your customers, you really have to think about how you're transforming the business, the people within that organization and how they're better servicing them. And I like to talk about the government, uh, GDS, Government Digital Services. I think everyone's familiar with that. It's very successful, but you might not be aware. They started talking about transformation in 2011, and they're still in their 19-year plan. So this, this thing around transformation is a journey. And I think when we're thinking about helping these companies, whether we're working internally for a client or whether we're in an agency supporting our clients, is that technology or that product, that's only 30% of the solution. The other 70% are the human beings. And that's why I said to transform, you really have to do it from the ground up and think about the human beings. Um, just really quickly, a, a bit about myself. Um, my background is very much human factors engineering. Uh, I've been working for over 20 years. It's great to see an early colleague of mine, Anska, here <laughs> in the room. Um, and really, I think the things I've always been doing is really to help people and businesses optimize performance, optimize getting the right outcomes. And that can be through physical design of workspaces, which did, did earlier in my career, to designing product services, and even thinking a little bit around business design as well. But specifically today, I want to talk about one uh, global pharmaceutical that we've, we've been working with for quite a few years. And it's interesting, this experience, because they started out, they came to us and they said, look, we just need to create um, a portal for all of our healthcare practitioners to come to. Um, and really what was happening was they had this plethora of, of websites in different countries and different therapy areas. It was really getting confusing to work with them. So they said, can you help us design um, this web portal? And actually it was through that experience of working with them that we actually managed to transform them into stop being uh, marketing led and to start being human centric led. So let me tell this story. Some of this won't be new to you, uh, but I'm hoping I can help you look at things in a different way to think about what you guys do in your own careers and in your own jobs. But to tell this story, I want to first talk a little bit about um, the pharmaceutical industry. And we do have Rob here who can probably highlight a bit more. This is quite crude high level. But to tell this story, I think, is really important because in our jobs, when we're trying to help our our clients, our organizations transform and be more human centric, we need to understand the context within which they work. And pharmaceuticals, I think, you know, historically were making very large profit margins. In fact, as, as large as most of the banks, they were looking at 40% profit margins. And a lot of the criticism was coming their way and they were saying, well, actually, we need that for R&D. And it's true, actually, if you look at the revenue, they were spending anywhere from 15 to 30% in, in R&D, um, making better medicines, better treatment plans to help people. But what was interesting as well was historically, they were also spending one and a half to two times that in marketing, sales and marketing activities. And for me, that was a real big sign around where they felt was the best place to put their money and their time uh, to get better outcomes for themselves. Um, and so I think what's happening, and I say today, but actually this is what today it's been going on for probably the past three, four years, is uh, the, the landscape is really changing. Similar to the financial services landscape, what we're seeing is 
all that hard work that pharmaceuticals put into R&D, they have patents, so they're able to protect um, their products a bit more. What's happening is those patents are coming due. So these generics are coming in and able to um, sell their products much cheaper. That's really, really, that's hard, right? Um, the other thing was we were all well aware of the global state of healthcare today. People are living longer, there's more chronic illnesses. So that's putting pressure on the NHS and they're also putting pressure on pharmaceuticals in terms of pricing. And I think there's something really interesting happening. People's expectations of, of digital, expectations of products and services um, are getting so much more higher and they're so much more mature in terms of what they expect. Um, and I think we can say in a lot of cases, some of those services we're seeing from some of the pharmaceuticals is lagging behind. Um, and in fact, it's, it's a shame there was going to be someone from Babylon here today who's one of those disruptors, um, but they're not here to, to talk today. And I guess really what we're seeing is these pricing pressures are meaning that pharmaceuticals have dimish, diminishing profits. They don't have the same marketing profits and budgets that they used to have. So one of my thoughts was, hey, how can we help them make better use of those diminishing products, pro profits rather? How can we think about not using digital and websites to push market, but how can we help those go further to create engagement with healthcare practitioners and patients so they can do some of that, that work for them? Uh, and that's really what we were thinking about, is how can we do that? Which leads to my first point. If you want to help transform an organization, you need disruption or chaos. No organization will change, whether that's foolproof or the UXPA or any pharmaceutical, no one will change unless they believe the way they're working today is not going to be successful in the future. So if you want to help transform, you've got to have some sort of disruption or chaos. And luckily, the client who approached us could see that and came to us. And as I mentioned before, he came to us and said, gosh, yeah, we have, you know, X number of websites across different countries, different therapies, people spawning random microsites all over the place. He's like, this isn't the most effective way to run. Can you help us consolidate those into one responsive web portal? And we said, well, yes, of course, we'd love to help you. And it was interesting, when he came to us, he was like, yeah, we just need to make it easy to find and use. And we thought, oh, well, yeah, we can do that. And, and yes, I won't um, deny it. They needed some help on just making it a bit easier. But surely that's not going to make their diminishing mar marketing profits go further, right? How can we help their budgets go further? So um, before we met with him, we did a little bit of research ourselves and we came back and said, look, can we reframe your brief for you a little bit? We think we need to help you better engage with healthcare practitioners and patients. And in that meeting, we we're able to talk to them um, quite confidently around, we can see that a lot of the work you're doing is selling as opposed to um, servicing. And we shared some real quotes that came from users. We had one um, healthcare practitioner was saying, hey, I want my digital to make my work life easier and better, just like it does in my personal life. And another person said, oh, just stop selling to me and start understanding what I need. Um, and therefore, that's why we said, let's look at a differentiated um, experience. And it was really great. So we were talking to the senior director of digital, and that really resonated with him and the team. And actually kind of opened up a bit more and said, actually, we know these healthcare practitioners, HCPs, just don't use our websites. We know they're not using it. We have the data to show. They were getting like a thousand visits per year on some of their sites. And he recognized too that actually they've just made it too difficult to do business with them. It was confusing, difficult to use, and they could see themselves. There was a big focus um, on, on marketing. And what was really interesting is we had some people within this organization say, yeah, but HCPs don't trust pharma. They don't want to work with pharma. They don't expect to be serviced. Uh, and very quickly, we could turn that down and say, no, that's not true, actually. What HCPs are saying is, if you can solve my needs, of course we'll work with you. It wasn't actually really about not trusting. It was more about, you're selling to me. I'm getting tired of this. And so we could quickly turn that misconception around uh, and move forward. And so my second point about if you want to help transform an organization, the next thing you need is you do need a champion at the top. And I'm not saying necessarily a C-suite, but at least someone who has the ears of the C-suite who can support you um, in making some of those changes. Let me explain this a little bit more about why, why that was so. Um, as we started working with the team, we started to recognize that the silos, the departmental silos they had across their medical team, their marketing team, their IT team was making it really difficult. Because what was happening is 
over the years, they just stopped sharing information. Um, there was power struggles. And I think it's also important to note, I mean, this organization had been around for 100 years and they were very, very successful because of their medical and marketing tradition. So, so why change if you've been so successful? And that's where you started to get these silos. And so what we had to do is we needed the senior um, director of digital to work with us to have enough clout to be able to say, we've got to break down these silos. We need to have one team working together. Um, and that was really, really helpful. So for the first time ever, we actually managed to get um, a much tighter integration. So we had a tighter integration of research, both the research we provided from user experience, as well as the research their marketing team created, which was very good. We had the medical team, we had legal and compliance, as well as IT. And actually what that meant was because we started to collaborate and work together without the silos for the very first time, we we're actually able to get um, faster decision making. Initially, no. <laughs> it took a bit of time, but in time that decision making happened more quickly. And one of the things we did to do that, if as, as psychologists and researchers, I'm sure you've heard of forming, storming, norming, performing, one of the most important things we did was bring the whole team together, that entire project team together. And we did a two-day uh, workshop session to help us all get aligned and creating to what is that North Star we're trying to head towards? What is it we want to create? Um, and through working together, we're able to say, yes, this is ideally what we want to do. We want to empower world-class practitioners. These are the behaviors we want them to do. These are our principles we want to get to. Um, and these are the outcomes that we're going to measure to say that we've, we've got there. And because we created that vision from the ground up, I know sometimes when we, we work with clients, they'll have management consultancies that sort of dictate this is what you need to be doing. Whilst you can take that input, I think you really need to get the team working together and building that vision together. Because if you don't have it, we're not aligned, we're not all bought into it. Uh, and that was a really, a really big um, success. So my third point is if you want to transform um, and shift ways of working, you really need to create that one team um, and remove the silos to get people aligned and have that shared vision that everyone can buy into. Um, so the next step was like, great, so we understood what it is we need to got, get to. We had the right people in the room, where we wanted to get to now. And we had some of the research the marketing team had done, some of the research management consultancy had done. Let's get into it, right? I think this is familiar to everyone. You can always go double diamond, um, this iterative approach. Um, this is where we face the biggest barriers. This is where, oh my goodness, I won't lie, it was really, really painful. Okay, wh why? So if you think about whatever you want to call it, you know, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Let's do some exploration, discovery, bring it in. Let's do some, again, designing and then refining and then implementing. At the beginning of this cycle, it's very much around, do we have the certainty of the problem? And often that's very much fed by data. And at the very end, implementation is really very much about, um, is this the right thing? Is it ready to go? Can we launch it? And again, that's all about data. Have we got the right product? And data is something marketing teams and IT teams are very comfortable with. So that was great. We were, we were in a great place. But when we got to this part here, the first co-creation, we had our vision, we want to start co-creating. This is where we started to have some problems because now we're talking about we want to do some research and go deep. Um, it's about asking why, it's about observing, and we're going to have significantly less people than you're used to. And people, they really struggled with that. Um, and it was really hard. And so we started thinking about, hmm, they're not quite understanding the power of design research, the power of using insight to, to help form our decisions and what we're going to design. And I realized it was a problem with understanding the difference between data and insight. So I want to tell you a story about data insight, which I think I've been able to use the story a lot to help people start to understand the difference. So in this co-creation workshop, um, the, we, we had a piece of data point that came out as part of this co-creation. GPs are time poor. Yeah, agree. D don't disagree with that, that's true. Okay, but as designers, we're like, what do we do with that? What are we gonna do? Yeah, okay. So we, ha we had to ask the question to the whole group, but wh why? Why are they design poor? Uh, sorry, why are they time poor? Um, and it was great. They had the answer. Um, another person said, well, we know they have 10-minute consultations. Gosh, that's not a lot of time. Gosh, yeah, okay, but what do we do with that? And then the, the client had hired um, healthcare experts in the, in the area of healthcare and behavioral change, and they provide some really good insight. They said, well, actually, 
patients don't feel like doctors really connect with them. They don't feel like the doctors really understand them, and therefore they're not engaging with their treatment plan. And again, this is true. Like, yeah, that's a data point. So I'd say that's a bit of insight, but I'm like, I'm still not sure. Like, something doesn't feel right. My instincts are going, it's not quite right. And so we tried to unpack a little more about what would we do with that. And um, one of the guys jumped to conclusions, that's it. I know exactly what we're going to do to solve this problem. We are going to build an app to teach GPs how to have better consultations. Uh, wow, oh, okay, not sure, okay, and we talked it through, and very quickly the sponsor went, yeah, I can tell we don't know enough here. And so we convinced them to say, let us do a little bit of design ethnography and actually get into uh, what was happening. And so we started asking the questions in that design ethnography work, observing, going like, what does that actually mean, having 10-minute consultations? What are they spending their time doing? What's happening before? What's happening after? What's going on? And that's when we said, aha, we got it. So what we learned was that actually GPs only had one minute in between each consultation. And so that meant they didn't really have a lot of time to go to the bathroom, let alone think about, okay, what's going on with this patient? What have I done? So in that 10-minute consultation, the first five minutes was just trying to figure out what, oh God, what did I prescribe last time? What was going on? Uh, what have they been doing? Um, and the other thing to keep in mind, back then it's like often on a shared device, often on um, their own devices, often with poor Wi-Fi, uh, often a whole bunch of different systems. <laughs> so it took them at least five minutes to kind of get that. And then they, they had about two or three minutes to actually start talking to the patient around like, so how are you feeling and what, why, why did you come here today? So we found out they actually only really had two minutes to really engage with that patient to figure out do I need to change the treatment? Where, where are we going to go with this? How can I engage and create that engagement? So I thought, this is a really important point because we said, had we all jumped down the, we're going to create a tool to teach GPs how to have better consultations. Well, it didn't matter. They only had two minutes. So no matter how good you are, you still only have two minutes. So we said, actually, the problem we're trying to solve and the solution we're trying to build is how do we give GPs back that 10 minutes with their patient? And that's the difference between um, data and insight. And that really helped, and that did get the rest of the team understanding and engaging uh, and us working together in, in a more effective way. Um, but I won't lie to you, it really, really wasn't easy. And I think for me, this has probably been one of my, the biggest learnings in my, my career, I'd say, is um, what I call the emotional roller coaster in any project you do particularly if you're working with someone who's never done um, human-centered design, design iterations, what they call it, design sprints, what have you, is you've got to trust in the process. And what happens is you go through these moments of clarity and genius. I know exactly what we need to do. And then as you unpack the layers, you go through this moment of confusion and, oh, shit, I have no idea what I'm doing. What am I going to do? This workshop isn't working. They're not getting and else. I'm like, oh, yeah, this moment of genius again, clarity. And I think the thing we have to remind ourselves, the double diamond coaster, it's normal. And trust in it, trust in yourself, and bring that, bring that team on that journey with you, because that will really help you um, become more effective. Um, so that it would be the next point I'd say, if you really want to help um, an organization transform and shift, you need to bring them on that journey with you. So we, that, that, that was the first project we did with that client, and it was really, really great because actually um, it then spread into a lot more projects, and they started thinking about bringing in um, insight sooner. It was wonderful. Got to work with farmers on animal health, which was quite, quite fun, but another story. Um, and actually, later on in that relationship, um, they came to us with another project. It was really exciting. They said, look, we want to really rethink how we are servicing um, HCPs and patients. And we want to try something a bit different. We want to, you'll hear a lot of people from talk about going beyond the pill, actually thinking about the services they can provide. And so we want to do something um, to really help HCPs and patients and maybe even do it completely unbranded. Oh, wow, this is great. And so that felt really good because we had this really strong meaning. Everyone could believe, like, we want to help people lead long and healthy lives, right? That's strong. People can believe in that. And through working together and doing some initial research with patients and HCPs and the NHS, Everyone seemed to latch on to, how do we give people back control of their health? And we're like, yeah, that's something we want to do. Now, it's a bit tricky, right? The, the, I think the healthcare landscape is extremely complex, a lot of moving parts. Um, and it's, you know, pharmaceuticals don't make money from giving out free services. They still have to sell treatment plans. And so 
you really have to think about how can we help them deliver this service in a way that they can actually execute on it, so making sure their teams have the skill sets to do it, um, and they're able to do it in a cost-effective way. So one of the things we did was we thought about, well, how could we think about using technology as a tool to better reach these people in a cost-effective way? So one of the first things we started to think about was, well, what are what is our computers and technology good at, and what are humans good at? Um, and we know, especially with, with the power of the cloud, computers are great with computational power, with recall, they're good with projecting, um, they're good with displaying data and repetition. But what humans are really good at are perceiving, understanding, inspiring, empathy. And I think your health is very personal and a very emotional time. So you really think carefully about when you introduce a technology and when you need to keep that human there. So what we decided to do is let's start looking at the patient journey and start thinking about where can we leverage that power of technology and where can we leverage that power of, of the human being. Um, this is a very crude, high-level patient journey just to kind of exp explain um, what we did. Um, so you've got the different things from diagnosis to coming out with a treatment plan, initiation, making sure the patient has all the right tests to join it, get on it, monitor, and then reassess treatment. And one of the things that came up in that journey and in the research we'd been doing, the ethnographic work, through a, other, a lot of many different projects, it wasn't just this one, and we kept hearing it over and over again, every now we kept hearing HCP saying, ah, oh, yeah, you just can't trust patients, they always lie. I know that's not what they, they mean, right? But they were saying that, going, what's going on? We need to unpack this. Again, that's a data point. What's the insight behind it? But equally, we'd often hear patients saying, as I said earlier, oh, my GP or my HP just doesn't understand me. They're not connecting with me. And so we started to think about the idea of jobs to be done and really exploring what was going on. And if you think of the first one around patients lie, well, one of the things we looked at is if you think about it, your HCP and patient, you have that 10-minute consultation. And then in between consultations, even something like diabetes, which is a, is a chronic condition, it could be six months, it could be 12 months before you see that person. I don't know about you, but I can never remember what I ate last week, let alone what exercise I did, how I was feeling, what my eye doctor told me. Um, yeah, I can't remember what all these specialists told me six months ago, let alone what I did last week. So I think we need to sort of remind ourselves, that, well, no, patients aren't relying, it's we're asking them to rely on faulty memories. And I think I mentioned before around, you know, how HCPs are time poor, right? So my doctor doesn't understand me. Well, of course, they only have two minutes to understand you. How can they? And so we started thinking about, great, how can we start using technology data re recall to help give a more accurate picture of, of how the patient's been feeling, what they've been doing, and what can we do for the doctor to really quickly make sense and, and pull that data together in a really quick way? And the other thing we did to try and unpack that a little bit was through working with the, with the patient, um, and some of the ethnographic work was we started to recognize that actually the other thing that both patients and HCPs were complaining about was everything I get is so generic. And even HCPs were going, why can't I get something more tailored? Um, so if you're talking to someone who has a high rice diet and you start talking about cut out bread, what well, doesn't mean anything? If you're talking to someone, go to the gym more. I live in a rural place, I don't have access to a gym. Um, and so one of the things we started thinking about is how can we use technology to help create a more personalized experience. Um, and the next slide, can I just ask no one to take pictures and, and post this? Um, I can share it with you, but um, don't want this live. We started looking at, can we create an app that sits with the patient? It's a way for the patient to then take back control and take ownership and responsibility of their own data, um, their own well-being. We talked about creating ways of like, what do I want to focus on? So in that time between consultations, they can start thinking about what's important to me. No, it's not about losing five pounds. It's like, you know, I really want to feel great. I want mobility so I can go to my daughter's wedding or my granddaughter's christening. So creating that meaning which will, that will better help people to, to engage with their treatment and, and um, their health. But also, how do we capture some of those things so we can capture what's been going on, we can get them to capture what happens when they're at, at some of the referrals that they're going to. Um, and then we can look at a way of displaying that information to give a better snapshot to the physician when they get into that consultation so they can get a better snapshot and make some, some, some uh, more informed decisions so they can get back at least another three minutes, hopefully, of those 10 minutes. So the last point that I wanted to share um, is that actually 
whilst I said 30% is the technology in the solution and 70% is the human, that 30% can be powerful. So think about how we can leverage the power of technology and leverage the power of humans um, to get better outcomes for, uh, for people. And I have to say, it has been really, really rewarding. I think if I look back on that first story I was telling you, um, goodness me, these sort of quick stand-ups were only supposed to last 20 minutes. They'd often last an hour, and just being these massive debates, there was this woman in the US, marketer, just constantly grilling us on our techniques over and over again. But I think a moment came when all of a sudden we were in a meeting, and she stood up, and she was our biggest champion about following human-centered design techniques. And the whole team was just like, oh my gosh, this is a breakthrough. So for us, that was the biggest, biggest success. And that's when we could say we genuinely helped shift that culture and that new way of thinking. Um, obviously, our champion was quite happy. From 1,000 visitors a year to 1,000 visitors per month was quite good. That was for the portal. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of big wins. So I guess I want to say, in, in, in summary, if you really want to help an organization transform, remain competitive in disruptive times, we have a role we can do. Um, you need disruption to trigger change. You need to help them recognize they need to do things differently because they won't succeed working the same way they have been. You do need someone at the top because there are times when you're going to have to maneuver the internal power struggles and to bring people together. Um, bring that team together. Um, think about forming, storming, norming, performing. Think about making sure you all have a shared vision that you've worked towards. Um, and think about how you can leverage humans and technology. And in doing that, I'm proud to say we did help shift that culture. We did help modernize some of their services um, and get them to look in the world in a different way. Um, and as well, I have to say, with the trials and tribulations, at the end of the day, it was also a more enjoyable way to work as a team. Thank you. And that was bang on time. I know. <laughs> well done. Well done. So I think we have a few minutes for questions. Any questions? There are questions, thank um, you. You talked about kind of having some homes, that, especially at the beginning, a difficult relationship with some of the key stakeholders in this kind of transformation process. Are there any kind of big learnings or like techniques or different things you tried? Um, Kind of help them get along on board with that journey. I know that it's like a long process and it doesn't just happen overnight. It, it doesn't. And I actually tell you that this, this one individual, this marketing woman, um, part of the problem we actually hadn't quite thought about was we use a lot of similar language. We talk about personas, we talk about segments, but what we realized is we both came in with a, oh, I know what I'm talking about, you must do too. And with that's when we realized, oh gosh, we had different interpretations of what those things meant. So actually we spend a lot of time trying to understand each other. Um, and so I think that's really important. It's not just about us being understood, it's about us taking the time to understand them. So that was a big learning. So we started to share different ways of doing things and talking a little bit more about how they get used as well. Um, I think, not to sound condescending, I think there's a role we have to play in help educating, educating ourselves as well as educating the people we're working with to make sure we are aligned on what we're doing. And as much as you can get face-to-face -face time, I know that's tough, if you can get together at any point, the beginning of the project just to start understanding each other is, is really helpful. I think that those are the two biggest things and get them to observe the work, the research that you're doing, get them to see it, find ways of bringing it to them if you can and that again that helps them start, ah oh, okay that's what you mean by. How did you uh, get access to the GPs? Did you go via the pharma companies or did you go through other routes to no. get access? And we do, so we, um, we actually have a field work team, so we do our own recruitment. Um, it's hard. <laughs> that, that was the other really interesting part of it. So we use our own recruitment team to go through. So we recruit, like I think everyone probably familiar with recruiting and recruitment briefs and screeners. Uh, you do need to be a member of the BHBIA here in the UK. So make, you have to join that. So there's some, if anyone's interested, I can go into a lot more detail what you, you need to do. I think what was really interesting is there's a lot of regulations for good reason and, 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 and healthcare. But I think what's interesting is the interpretation of these regulations that were written for days of print not, um, not the, w the web. So we spent a lot of time in sort of debate around, no, no, this is a service, not a marketing thing. So I don't think the same things apply. Um, but I guess that actually that was the one thing I didn't share, sorry. That was nothing. It used to take us four weeks just to get our discussion guides, assets and recruitment signed off. So, um, and, and by the end of it, we managed to get to two weeks. 
So we're actually able to do iterative sprints. So it happened like it'd be like a month to do a sprint. We, by the end, we got it two weeks, but that was working really, spending a lot of time. So if you do want to do something like this, iterative sprints, I recommend your first couple of sprints, make them longer with the aim to shorten them because it just takes a lot of time to kind of get things worked out. And then once your legal and compliance team starts saying, oh, that's what you're doing, that's what you're tweaking, then I think you can, you can speed it up. I think my question is more related to adoption of your applications. I would like to know what was being done during the design phase in order to help that. Um, patients and general public are historically um, really afraid to give their own data to pharmaceutical companies. Again, because they've been seen like a big ego for quite some time. Um, so how did you overcome this? Because um, data fear is, is like a major trend to begin with. And if you combine it by inputting so much personal information built by Big Pharma, um, did you do anything to help users to adopt this without having access? For full transparency, those apps are not live. Um, but in the research that we did, we did include patients. And when we talked about it being their data, it's their app, they choose to show it to the people they want to show it to. That, that didn't come up because they could see that it was about helping them help with their health. So that didn't come up in the research. They felt really comfortable to be using it and sharing it. Now, it wasn't live, so, so it's not live. Um, interestingly, we've done a lot of research with um, physicians, surgeons, et cetera, because even they've said, oh, can't trust pharma. But what's actually real in, in data, in different countries are more hesitant than others. So we've done work in Germany, um, Spain as, as well, and they're, they're actually more hesitant. But the, the really interesting thing that we found from the HCP point of view, where we do have something that is out there and that's live, was they said, look, if this is genuinely going to help me answer the questions I need to answer, I'm happy to use it. So HCPs will ask questions to pharma, often called med medical answers, and they will get things back, and they trust that. So why is it different if they're, if they're using this tool? So it was, some of it was just around get rid of the selling and start answering real questions, and, the, and you'll get that shift. So they're saying, actually, someone was like, no way, I'll never use pharma, they're this, they're that, and actually like, well, wait a minute, the clinical trials I trust, as long as I know the source where it's coming to, I can apply my own filter, and actually, if I don't have to use um, all these different, they've got thousands of things that they're using, some of them even use Wikipedia and Google, right? <laughs> if I can just go to one place, I'll use it. Just tell me where it's coming from, and I can apply my own filter to the, to the bias. So there is, there's an interesting thing around trust and how much data, data you share um, and what you use. But it's a good question. That, that app is not live. You sort of touched on it there and you were talking about the local markets. Um, going back to the portal, this is a challenge I face on a day-to-day -day basis. How did you get local markets to buy into what you were doing when they're traditionally very set in their ways, different regulations, they know what they want and don't necessarily buy in at a global level? So yes. did you have a, a challenge, shall we say? So there's two, two pharmaceuticals we've been working with, um, which it very much is, and being North American, I say this, there's often, often they're, these two happen to be based in the US, they're headquartered in the US, and there is a very much, we're North America, we know everything, everything will work. So yes, I was, uh, that was an issue. Um, but because we involved a few representatives of the local markets to pull that in, um, and we did have to think about what is 80% global um, uh, that we can apply that doesn't change, and then what are some of the local things that we need to think about. In the portal, it was creating, um, we ended up creating, um, a set of design patterns, and what we call a pattern library, to help then those local teams think about how they put those pieces together, but still ensuring they had some control of those, those local sites. We have time for one more question. What, is the, um, what would you like to do next to sort of push the client forward a little bit more, as far as whether it's a project or, you know, maturity with, within their organization or something like that? That's a really good question. I haven't even thought about that. Um, I would have really liked to have seen that, that app thing get further and, and, and go live. Um, I will say our champion left, so the culture's changed a bit, gone back a bit backwards. Um, I don't know, actually. That's a good question. Sorry, you've stumped me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think think about 
the other clients we're working with, um, I think really getting them to shift a bit around, um, really thinking about you don't have to, hmm, shift their interpretation of the regulations to think about what it means to service and move to a bit more of a service design model uh, and think about the power of un unbranded and um, services that they could do that would still create value. Thank you. Thank you very much.